Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Helen DeGuerry Simpson. An Experiment of the Dead. It was a most shocking surprise to that highly respectable firm of solicitors, Messrs. Walker, Paradise, and Walker, when Lady Paula Lydiard went off the rails, causing almost as much confusion and loss of life as might an express train similarly faded. She had been in the habit of drinking too much, spending too much, and risking her neck in swift vehicles far too lightly. But she had somehow kept clear of scandal, which to the legal mind, and indeed to most other minds, meant lovers. Then, at forty-six, what must she do but fall in love with a boy of twenty-three, a young soldier, and announce that she intended to marry him? Alaric Lydiard, who had been married to her for twenty years, and was a little sorry for the young man, refused flatly to give her her freedom. Mr. Percival Walker listened, not in comprehension, to his reasons. She'll get sick of him, you know, and it's not fair to young Ninian. He'll have to send in his papers. They don't care for this sort of thing in the brigade. He won't take her on if it means blowing all his prospects sky high. We'd better sit tight till she quiets down. Mr. Walker agreed heartily with this solution, which was well within the traditions of his firm. Quite, said Mr. Walker, quite. We may safely leave the whole matter to time. With which words, followed by a smile as of parchment cracking, he sent Alaric Lydiard to his death. For Lady Paula, caught in their trap of inaction, sought escape as an animal might. There was an accident. The car in which she was driving her husband to a dinner party on the other side of the county turned over into a granite quarry. Lady Paula, bleeding and exhausted, was picked up by a passing motorist as she stumbled, in her evening shoes, towards the nearest village for help. Alaric Lydiard lay at the bottom of the quarry with the car on top of him. When they recovered his body, the head was found to be smashed in. All very natural, given the weight of the car and the thirty-foot drop. But an alert young doctor noticed one or two things. He observed that the head wounds, under their mask of blood, were numerous, smallish, and deep. A blood-stained spanner was found, hidden under a pile of stones. There were inexplicable stains on the gray upholstery of the car. In short, the conclusion was inescapable. Lady Paula had halted the car, struck her husband repeatedly with a spanner, killing him. Then, getting out and putting the car in gear, had sent it with its freight straight at the fence that railed the quarry. The coroner's inquest, the trial at the Assizes, took their course. Messrs. Walker managed with despairing skill the only defense on a criminal charge that had ever come the firm's way. In vain. Paula Lydiard, daughter of one of those earls whose name in white paint adorned Messrs. Walker's deeds boxes, was to die, hanged by the neck, on a given date in November. The day after the announcement that her appeal had failed, an odd-looking figure called upon Mr. Percival Walker. He had the look of a not very exemplary clergyman, grossly fat, and of an appearance disturbing to confidence. He spoke well, however, and made an extraordinary request in very seemly language. Briefly, he wished for an interview with Lady Paula in prison, an interview with her alone. Impossible, said Mr. Percival Walker with finality. Apart from the technical impossibility of introducing a stranger at this time, I would say it is not likely that a gentleman of your cloth would meet with good reception. Is she bitter? asked the clergyman eagerly, terrified, reluctant to die. Mr. Walker regarded him stiffly, and the visitor resumed more calmly. The fact is, I am a relative of Lady Paula, and I have a communication of some importance to make to her. Mr. Percival Walker looked down at the visitor's card, which read, The Reverend Dionysus Luan, and turned his eyes toward the red volume of Burke's Landed Gentry. Mr. Luan followed the glance, smiling. By all means, said he, you will find me there. Her first cousin, no cure of souls, at present. Mr. Walker did not consult the volume. Recollection stirred in him. This was the son of Lady Paula's only uncle, a recluse the author of books on certain occult subjects, 
a practitioner of certain odd and mystical experiments. Certainly, he was the nearest relative of the firm's unfortunate client. All the same. May I know your purpose in wishing to see her? inquired Mr. Walker. I can only inform you that it is a private matter of the first importance. To me, at any rate, the clergyman answered, and there was a kind of urgency, almost a glitter, in his small, sunken eyes. Mr. Walker turned the matter over, taking into consideration his visitor's cloth, with his relationship to the condemned woman, he thought it might be done. The clergyman beamed and swallowed, clasping his fat hands together in gratitude. Would Mr. Walker be so good as to approach the proper authorities and communicate their decision? Mr. Luan could not really express his obligations. And the date of the execution, so soon? Unhappy woman, poor Paula. With this lamentation, a clergyman heaped up from his chair, shook hands with a clinging pressure, and went rolling and laboring out through the old-fashioned high doorway. Mr. Walker, moved by a need for air, opened the window a little wider after his departure. Ten days later he sat opposite Mr. Dionysus Lewin in a railway carriage. Both men were reading, but while Mr. Walker deplored the Gadarene course of British politics as revealed in the pages of the Times, Mr. Luan was deeply intent upon a red leather book which had the appearance of a manual of devotion. He seemed to read always the same few pages, turning back again and again, as though committing some passage to memory. Once, when moving lips and half-shut eyes showed him engrossed, the book slipped to the floor. Mr. Walker, active and polite, bent quickly to recover it, glancing as he did so at the open pages. He observed that one was devoted to a diagram in black and red, which might have been an astrological design, except for certain symbols which had no obvious connection with astrology. He had time only to notice this, and to read a few words in large type which headed the opposite page, when Mr. Luan took the book from him, eyeing the solicitor shrewdly as he offered civil thanks. Mr. Walker had not sat thirty years in his swivel office chair for nothing. He met the look as blandly as he accepted the thanks, with some comment upon the difficulty of combining high railway speeds with ordinary comfort. He had half a mind to inquire of Mr. Luan the meaning of the words which had caught his eye. If you would have a dead man's spirit to attend you, and do your bidding in all things, there is a way how it may be done. But the clergyman, having stowed the red-covered book in his pocket, seemed inclined to doze, and Mr. Walker, who regarded his client's occult studies with the disfavor natural to a priest of the obvious, permitted him to sleep. Arrived in the northern town, they went direct to the prison. It was arranged that Mr. Luan should wait with what patience he could upon an unyielding office of works chair, while Mr. Walker interviewed his client and prepared her for the visit to follow. He returned in a short time, shaking his head, with the news, to him not unexpected, that the condemned woman had no wish to see her cousin, and that the matter could not be further pressed. One cannot insist, the solicitor told Mr. Luan. A condemned person retains certain rights. Mr. Luan deliberated, then, slowly drawing a notebook from his pocket, wrote a few words, tore and folded the sheet, and courteously requested Mr. Walker to deliver the note. Pray take it. I believe she will see reason. It is, said Mr. Luan, with an odd smile, the smile of a man thinking of treasure, a necessity that she should see me. The note was delivered and read. Five minutes later, Mr. Walker, secretly marveling, was informing the clergyman that his cousin had changed her mind. Mr. Luan showed no surprise, but got to his feet with a kind of clumsy sprightliness, and went billowing down the corridors at the heels of a wardress to that apartment known to prison officials as the solicitor's room. Lady Paula stood there, a wardess by her, at the other side of a wide table. Her eyes had lost none of their defiance. Her hair was as black as he remembered it. She still had beauty, but it was contradicted and marred by the line of her mouth, cruel, wholly relentless. She spoke loudly and at once, without greeting. Is Ninian coming? What's the message? Why the hell doesn't Ninian come? Mr. Lewin glanced at the wardess and spoke with the authority his cloth permitted. I presume I may speak with the prisoner alone. The wardress hesitated, 
and compromised by retiring to just outside the door, which she left half open. Lady Paula gave a contemptuous short laugh. Then, seeing the gold chain stretched across her cousin's ample black waistcoat, said suddenly, "'What's the time?' Mr. Lewin told her. She began to tap with her fingers on the table, almost as though she were counting, and then broke off. "'Well, what's the message from Ninian? You said you had a message.' "'I have none,' answered Mr. Lewin placidly. "'It was a ruse to speak with you.' She did not move, but gave him, without turning her head, a hooded look. He continued, "'I have something to say more important than any message from that young man.' "'In two days I shan't be alive,' said Lady Paula harshly. Two days in a few hours. I shall know more about it than you in two days. I don't want to talk about religion, thanks.' "'Nor do I wish to talk about religion,' replied Mr. Lewin. Lady Paula stared, gave a half-laugh. "'What sort of clergyman do you call yourself?' "'Wait,' said Mr. Lewin, one fat hand raised. "'Listen, if you please.' The wardress, standing by the door, could see Mr. Lewin's face. His lips moved without pause. The condemned woman sat, flung sideways on her chair. Her expression showed scorn— and later a kind of angry curiosity. The wardress looked away after a glance at her watch. Six minutes yet remained in the quarter hour permitted. She was a religious woman. The attitude of her charge to the prison chaplain had distressed her, and it was with satisfaction that she perceived the attention with which Lady Paula now heard this stranger clergyman. She began to walk a few steps this way and that, outside the door, to give them an illusion of greater privacy. Her next glimpse of the pair showed Mr. Lewin pushing a red-bound book towards the prisoner, and she was about to interfere, for, according to regulations, no interchange of books or papers was permitted. But the prisoner did not open the book, merely laid her hands on it, from which the wardress supposed that it must be a Bible, and let matters alone. The prisoner, hands crossed one above the other, seemed once more to be repeating some formula after the clergyman, and when this was over, kissed the red book, though with no very devout expression, and thrust it back along the table. By the wardress's watch it was almost time to interrupt them, but apparently the ceremony had not ended, and it was possible to stretch a point in the interests of salvation. She ceased her march, however, and stood in the doorway as a hint to the two engrossed persons. From this vantage point she heard, with some amazement, Mr. Lewin recite as follows— by which kiss thou, Paula, dost covenant and agree after death to be my servant in the spirit, to go wheresoever I shall bid thee, whether in earth in hell, and to obey me in all things, because by my knowledge I have the power to constrain thee. Fiat, fiat, say now, after me, Amen. Amen, said Lady Paula's voice. It was mocking, the voice her husband and lover had both of them known. "'But it looks to me as though you made a rotten bargain. "'I never could do as I was told. "'I don't suppose people change much afterwards.' "'Mr. Lewin smiled indulgently. "'She persisted. "'No, seriously, of course, I mean. "'It's all quite mad. "'But just by way of curiosity, "'what would happen if I turned out to be stronger than you?' "'Mr. Lewin looked at her, at the dominant mouth, "'the eyes expressionless as those of a snake, "'and, despite his confidence, felt a little disquieted. She went on. After all, I've committed a murder. What have you done? Where does this power of yours come from? You've read a lot of books. I, she looked at her hands, which had beaten out Alaric Lydiard's life, I've done things. I must take my chance, said Mr. Lewin, and made a curious gesture with his left hand in the air. Paul Lydiard leant back, surveying him with amusement and contempt, as she might have watched an unwieldy animal doing tricks. So thought the wardress, coming forward at this moment. Her prisoner disregarded her entirely, as she had become accustomed for forty years to disregard persons in attendance to her. "'Can't we go on?' she said. "'You take my mind off things. Can't we seal it in blood? Do something dramatic?' "'Unnecessary,' said Mr. Lewin, not smiling at this little joke, and pocketing the red book as he rose." You may shake hands, the wardress told her charge, who laughed, 
and blew Mr. Lewin a kiss. Goodbye, said she, and here's to our experiment. Lucky for you, wasn't it? It's not every day you get a hold of a collaborator who's about to be hanged. The word, thus defiantly and loudly spoken, caught her back into nightmare. She went out with the wardress, and Mr. Lewin heard her outside the door. What's the time? There aren't enough clocks in this damn place. Tell me the time, can't you? In their hotel that night, Mr. Walker inquired more particularly if the interview had been a success. I think so, answered Mr. Lewin slowly. Yes, I believe so. Time will show. This, Mr. Walker's own favorite maxim, had a reassuring sound. He had not been easy in his mind concerning the clergyman. Certain further memories had come back to him, one unsavory business in particular, with an odor of black magic about it, from the far-off days when Mr. Lewin had been an undergraduate at Cambridge. He rebuked himself now, and took up the conversation. "'Lady Paula has been something of a problem to the chaplain, I understand. It is shocking,' said Mr. Walker, pausing to clip a cigar, to consider what she has done with her opportunities, her determination, and her great beauty. "'Has she then such force of character?' inquired Mr. Lewin earnestly. That, answered Mr. Walker, pausing deliberately, would be an understatement. His bright small eyes concerned themselves with the tip of his cigar, but he was well enough aware of his companion's interest to continue. She is a woman of one idea at a time, impeded by no scruple that I have been able to discover. She wanted entire control of her husband. That implied the death of her mother-in-law. Oh, believe me, I have no doubt of the fact. She has twice done murder each time for the same reason, that she might have what she wanted. And what do you suppose she may want now? Life, answered Mr. Walker, without hesitation. She wants to go on living. The life of the body, I mean, for that has been her sole concern. I should say what she now deeply wants is a body to dwell in. But there is no way out for her this time unless, he regarded his companion with a half-smile, unless your studies can find her one. My studies, repeated Mr. Lewin, quickly for him. I am no wiser than my neighbors. What studies do you imply? Mr. Walker reminded him that one of his published works had to do with thaumatrogy. He did not remind him of the unsavory affair at Cambridge, whose details still dwelt vaguely in the back of his mind. Mr. Lewin laughed, disclaimed any practical belief in such matters, and feared that Lady Paula must place no reliance on him. A dangerous soul, then, said Mr. Walker to his cigar. This will sound to you superstitious, Mr. Lewin, but I cannot imagine so much violence, so much great determination, ended by so simple and obvious a process as strangling. It may be diverted, however, answered Mr. Lewin, turning up his eyes, to other purposes. Yes, to other purposes. Mr. Walker made no direct answer for he found his companion repulsive in these occasional sanctimonious moods. It had been decided that the solicitor and the clergyman should remain at hand in the northern town until Lady Paula could have no further need of their services. During this brief period of waiting, Mr. Lewin betrayed a certain very natural restlessness and discomfort of mind. Occasionally he questioned Mr. Walker with a notable intensity concerning Lady Paula's character, laying stress in particular upon its ruthlessness and strength. Could it be true that she had committed two murders? Two? Was she indeed so accustomed to have her own way in all things? Mr. Walker, having answered with some impatience that it was so, Mr. Lewin would return to the study of his red book. It never left him. Its bulk showed in his pocket, or else he was handling it, not reading, but holding it as though he found it comfortable to his fingers. Once he inquired of his companion if he intended to be present at the execution, Mr. Walker replied with distaste that such attendance was no part of his duty. It would be interesting, began Mr. Lewin, and checked. I should be glad to know how my cousin conducts herself. I may tell you this much, said the solicitor on an impulse, looking at him sideways. The interview with you appears to have done Lady Paula some service. She is no longer frenzied at the thought of death. I am happy to hear it, said Mr. Lewin, the tone contradicting the words. She has swung to the other extreme, Mr. Walker went on, as is her wont. 
she seems to anticipate the hour almost, I was going to say, almost with zest. He observed Mr. Lewin's cheesy face to take on a more absolute pallor at this, and indeed he personally found the new attitude of the condemned woman disturbing and unnatural. He changed the subject by ringing the bell and giving precise orders about being called in the morning. Mr. Walker that night slept but ill. So did Mr. Lewin, if the evidence of his neighbor's ears might be believed. Each time the solicitor woke, and he woke at all hours, he noticed a heavy shuffling tread next door, which told him that Mr. Lewin was awake and troubled. Mr. Walker was by no means indifferent, and he heard the bells of the church strike the hour of execution almost with relief. A minute later, just as the clanging of the bells died down, he heard a different and more sinister sound from the room next door. It was, unmistakably, the sound of a fall. Mr. Walker snatched his dressing gown and ran out into the corridor. Mr. Lewin's door was shut, but it opened to the turning of the knob. He ran in, pausing to press a bell for help, and looked about him. Mr. Lewin lay by the window, grossly sprawled on his back, the red-bound book beside him, open as it had fallen. Mr. Walker, in his concern for the man, could not but recognize that same page, that diagram, which he had seen for a moment in the railway carriage two days before. Even as he clasped his fingers upon Mr. Luan's pulse, his eyes were taken by the clear, ancient print, headed with words in larger type. An experiment of the dead. He read again and on, while his fingers noted the pulse's leapings. If you would have a dead man's spirit to attend to you, and do your bidding in all things, this is a way how it may be done. Get a promise of one that is to be hanged. A movement distracted his attention. Mr. Lewin's large head was moving from side to side, as though to free the neck from some constriction. And as Mr. Walker watched... The clergyman's eyes opened and surveyed him, bewildered, yet with a kind of triumph. They rolled once or twice, as the head had rolled, then blinked at Mr. Walker, who was gently shaking the wrist he still held, asked, "'Are you better, Mr. Lewin?' The answer came slowly, in a voice whose words and quality Lady Paula's solicitor heard with a sick certainty of recognition. "'Hello,' said the voice which was not Mr. Lewin's, though it came from his throat? What? What's the time? The End